Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C, and today we're going to do some more a &P. Specifically, we're going to do our third major exam, which will cover muscles and muscles and perhaps some more muscles. So let's dig into it. All right, I'm going to take you through an actual muscles exam that I gave to actual college students uh, not too long ago back when I played in the circus. So let's check these out. And they are, if you notice, not ABC style, but fill in the blank style to make them more challenging. So let's run through these as quickly as we can. Slow, sustained peristaltic contractions are the specialty of blank muscle. And it says which type. So you got three choices here, smooth, cardiac, or skeletal. And peristalsis, of course, is always done by smooth muscle. The most fatigue resistant muscle cells are those of which type? And that's going to be cardiac because we don't want our heart to fatigue. Blank is a dense connective tissue wrapping an entire skeletal muscle. Well, if we're going around the entire muscle, we want the one on the very most outside, and that would be the epimesium. Each muscle cell is enclosed in a delicate connective tissue wrapping called the blank. Now, this is the one we're looking for the smallest of those wrappings, and that's going to be endomesium. endomesium. Another name for the thin filament or thin microfilament is called actin. Myosin is the thick one. The plasma slash cell membrane of a skeletal muscle cell is called the, you could say, sarcolemma. That would be perfect. Found at every AI boundary within each myofibril, blank are channels running through skeletal muscle cells. So at every AI junction, you have a T-tube running down, also known as a transverse tubule. Chambers which serve as calcium wells comprise two-thirds of a muscle triad. Okay, so what are the parts of a triad? Well, it's going to be these T-tubes we just talked about in this question plus the two cisternae that are on either side. Those are where we find the calcium stored. So the two thirds of the triad that store calcium are cisternae. Dark striations called blank bands are formed where actin and myosin overlap along the length of a myofibril. Dark band, because it's got the letter A here, is simply the answer. A bands usually put a capital letter A there. The light bands are called I bands for the same reason. Blank are found at the center of each eye band. So what's in the eye band? Probably the best answer for at the center would be actin, but you could make an argument that you also find titan, the molecule titan there also. All right, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells. Remember, you can talk about the endoplasmic reticulum being the ER. So in muscle cells, it's simply called the SR, or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. For a skeletal muscle to contract, calcium must bind to blank, a regulatory protein on actin. So this is going to be troponin, troponin. A motor neuron and all the fibers it innervates is called a single motor unit. Motor unit. Synaptotagmins are proteins found in the terminal knobs of motor neurons. Fact. Tell me what they do when activated. All right, well, when they're activated, they allow vasculation of acetylcholine, or they can put ACH, a neurotransmitter, into a vesicle. How does neurotransmitter make its way across a neuromuscular junction? Well, it's released into it, and then very simply, it just diffuses across. Name a way that excess, I mean too much acetylcholine, ACH, is removed from neuromuscular junctions. There are several ways. If it's just diffusing across, it can simply diffuse out of the junction. Some of it is reuptaken, depending on the mechanism. And some of it is destroyed by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. A partial sustained muscle contraction is known as tone, muscle tone, or tonus. A continuous contraction with no relaxation is known as a cramp in common speech, but in a &P we call it tetany, tetany. Which ion is primarily responsible for hyperpolarizing excitable tissue? Watch my cursor. If you do the upstroke of the action potential, right, that's depolarization. If you do the downstroke 
that's called repolarization. Then if you do that undershoot and come back to normal, that's called hyperpolarizing. And anywhere on the way down, it's the same guy. K plus, right? Potassium is the answer. Potassium. Distinguish between isometric and isotonic. All right, isometric, there is no shortening of the muscle. And isotonic, there is shortening. That's probably the easiest way to remember that. Blank is the process in which more and more motor units are stimulated to create a stronger combined force. This is called recruitment, as it makes sense. We're going to recruit more guys to do more work. A muscle that provides most of the power of a given action is called the, well, there's a couple instances here. You could say agonist, that would work fine, or you could say PM or prime mover. Both of those would be correct in my book. Synergists, which stabilize a muscle's origin so that it does not move during contraction, are called. So these are weak synergists holding a muscle in place. Those are called fixators, fixators. The blank muscles protract the jaw during mastication. That would be chewing. They originate on the sphenoid bone and provide side-to-side -side grinding motion while chewing. Those are called the pterygoids, PT, right? Pterygoids. There, though, sorry, the blank are a set of four muscles that elevate the hyoid bone when swallowing. You would call those the suprahyoids, even though their actions are much more complicated than that. Suprahyoids is what I would be looking for there. The blank muscles of the neck are responsible for allowing the yes, yes, yes motion of the head. That's sternocleidomastoid. Be a really good choice there. Okay, the blank muscle, sorry I went too far there. The blank muscle is the deepest layer of the abdominal muscle. So doing the tire rule that we learned, T is the deepest, so that would be transversus abdominis. Name any one of the three major respiratory muscles that we discussed in our lecture, and that would be the diaphragm and the two sets of muscles known as the external and internal intercostal muscles. The action of the erector spinae group is what? Well, it gives it a name that gives it a way in its name, right? To erect the spine or to straighten up the back. The blank muscles pull the scapula medially toward the vertebral column. Okay, it's not quite levator scapula, but we're in the right area. The ones that pull it medially are the rhomboids, rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. Name the action which turns the palms facing up when they were previously facing down. So again, if you turn your palms up, it's like you're begging for some soup. And we learned that means supination is palms up. So supination. Putting them down is pronation. Where in the body would you look to find the piriformis muscle? Well, doesn't care where you would look. If you wanted to actually find it, you would look under the glutes, right? Or the butt. List the four muscles that make up the quadriceps group. Okay, makes sense there would be four. That would be rectus femoris, and then three vastus muscles, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. List the three hamstring muscles. This would be biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. The blank muscles of the sural region, that means the calf region, the lower leg, right? Pull the calcaneus, the foot bone toward the distal end of the femur, causing plantar flexion of the foot. So what that means is stand on your tippy toes, right? So what are the tippy toe muscles? You could argue it could be gastrocnemius and soleus. That would be the main two tippy toe muscles. Although there's some weaker ones in there that would probably work here too. To purse the lips, when we want to make kissy faces, mwah, 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 we contract the primarily, again, you're going to do more than one, but primarily you contract the orbicularis oris, the ring of muscle that is around the mouth. The bulk of the crushing force applied by the jaw is provided by the two prime movers of mastication, chewing, called the blank and the temporalis. So the other major chewing muscle is masseter, masseter. Where in the body would I look to find the genioglossus muscle? Genio refers to the chin, glossus referring to the tongue. So I would look for a muscle that's attaching the chin to the tongue. That allows you to stick your tongue out like a little kid would. 
List the four muscles which comprise the rotator cuff. To do the rotator cuff group, you need to know sits, S-I-T-S, but it's a little t. So that would be supraspinatus, infraspinatus, little t, teres minor, and subscapularis. All right, this used to be a matching section, but let's just go through it real quick and try to put in a definition has been given, but let's put the term that would fit the definition best. So the neuron cannot respond to a second stimulus, no matter how strong. That would be the absolute refractory period. The interior of a cell becomes less negative due to an influx of sodium. Okay, if we're bringing sodium in, that's going to depolarize the tissue, depolarization. Its function is to extend the length of the refractory period. Uh, that's hyperpolarization. That's the point of it is to make the refractory period a little bit longer. The declining phase of the action potential spike during which potassium ions rapidly diffuse out of the neuron. Again, this is repolarization. For the neurons we discussed is approximately negative 55 millivolts. Okay, that's going to be what we call threshold, although that can vary from tissue to tissue. Excess neurotransmitter is brought back into the terminal knob from which it came. That's called reuptake. The events whereby an action potential is pushed down the length of an axon, that is propagation of a potential. Also called a nerve impulse is an action potential, an AP, nerve impulse, same thing. An insufficient or very weak stimulus. Uh, several things here, but you could probably just call it a sub-threshold stimulus. That would be fine. For the neurons we discussed, it is minus 70 millivolts. Well, that's RMP, or resting membrane potential. The phenomenon whereby EPSPs, okay, that's excitatory postsynaptic potentials, are added together to reach threshold. That's called summation when we add them together, summation. Okay, that's the end of the game. If you didn't do so well, try it again until you can nail it, and that'll help you on your next test. All right. See you for the next talk. Bye-bye.